Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Friends of the Semmel Institute's Open Mind. We are so honored and privileged to have with us this evening the author of Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, a therapist, her therapist, and our lives revealed, Lori Gottlieb. In this funny, intimate, and thought-provoking memoir, which debuted at number five on the nonfiction bestseller New York Times list, what a feat. <laughs> and if that, as if that isn't enough, it has also been picked up by ABC to, for a television series with Eva Longoria. Lori, you're a rock star. <laughs> Lori, with warmth and humor, shares her insights not only about her professional experience, but her own journey through therapy. She takes the reader behind the scenes into a therapist's world, pulling back the curtain on the therapeutic process and offering an entertaining, illuminating, relatable account of the human condition. It's such an unbelievable read, you will find yourself laughing and crying within a few pages. Um, it's just brilliantly written and could not be more honored to have Lori here this evening. Along with being a practicing therapist here in Los Angeles where she grew up and a New York Times best-selling author of four books, including Stick Figures, which in 2005, when the Friends just began, we had a salon event at our board member Mia Silverman's home, and we featured Lori's book, Stick Figures. So we go way back with Lori Gottlieb. Lori also writes the weekly Dear Therapist advice column for The Atlantic and has written hundreds of articles related to psychology and culture, many of which have become viral sensations all over the world. A contributing editor for The Atlantic, she also writes regularly for The New York Times, and she appears frequently on uh, shows such as The Today Show, Good Morning America, CBS This Morning, CNN, and NPR. And I'm sure if you've been watching those shows recently, you have seen Lori. Um, and we're so proud that she's here with us this evening to uh, share her thoughts about this incredible book. And joining Lori in discussion is one of our favorite faculty members from the Semmel Institute, Dr. Robert Builder, or as I like to call him, Bob the Builder. <laughs> <laughs> he is a distinguished professor of psychiatry and psychology here at UCLA and is chief of medical psychology, which involves more than, than 100 psychologists across the health system. He also directs the Tenenbaum Center for the Biology of Creativity and does research on brain and behavior for the National Institute of Health. Um, before I welcome Lori and Dr. Builder up here to uh, have a discussion, um, for those of you here for the first time, and I think most of you have been here before, but just for the few people that haven't, this is part of our Open Mind Community Lecture and Film Series that brings together thought leaders in science and culture to present programs about mental health free to the public. Um, we we are very much like NPR or public radio. If you feel we're providing service to the community, we hope you will join our community of supporters. Um, on your way in this evening, you got an envelope. Inside that envelope is an index card. So after uh, Lori and Dr. Builder um, have their discussion. We are going to take questions, but we ask that you please write them down on the index card and then pass them to the aisle and we'll collect them. We won't be taking any questions directly from the floor and we really appreciate your cooperation with that. Getting back to, there's an envelope. So we hope that if you're not already a member, you will consider joining us and supporting us so we can continue to bring programs like this free to the public. Um, also in the envelope is a questionnaire, um, which we have actually not done before, and we would really appreciate your cooperation and help. We really want to know how we're doing, 
if the programs that we present are have been the quality that you have come to expect from uh, uh, from UCLA and the friends. And we want to know what we can do better. So we hope that you will take a few moments to fill out the questionnaire. Um, following the Q&A, there will be a book signing. Um, Lori will be autographing her book, which you can purchase directly from the UCLA bookstore who's here selling it. And that's all the housekeeping. I want to thank both of our speakers this evening for coming, taking the time from their very busy schedules to share their knowledge and expertise with us. So without further ado, a warm welcome for Lori Gottlieb and Dr. Robert Gilder. No, it's not high enough? We'll do, now, yeah. yes? Yeah. There we go. Okay. Fantastic. Well, there, what a... Now we're, now we're going. There we I go. I can hear it now. Awesome. Well, what an amazing crowd. Um, I was about to get upset on your behalf because we were introduced as Lori and Dr. Builder. And so I was thinking, that seems wrong. And then I realized, you are the Lori that I, if I can be elevated, then I will become Bob. Um, but it was actually me who was being dissed by being referred to as Dr. Builder, because I need that honorific. But anyhow, what a, what a work of genius you've uh, created. Thank you. Um, you know, it's really um, been a joy to read. Um, and um, I think that uh, the audience will be really interested in hearing a lot about the book and about you uh, and how you came to write this book. Um, and, uh, but first, maybe you could start by just telling us a little bit about your trajectory and what brought you to the point where you could write a book like this? Um, well, this is not going to, I don't know how much time we have here, um, <laughs> how I came to do this. It's 50 um, minutes. It's a session. It's, no, a, it's no. a session. Did <laughs> no. you guys know it was group therapy tonight? Is that what you're all here for? Um, so I, I had a very, I took a very circuitous route to becoming a therapist. I um, started off working in the entertainment business. I was working first in film and then I went over to work in network television at NBC, and the first shows that were premiering when I got there were um, these little shows. One was called Friends, um, and the other one was called ER. And I really, really liked doing the research for ER because I got to hang out in an emergency room with an actual ER doctor, as opposed to us network executives. And I got to see the real story. So I loved story. That was why I got into film and television, because I loved stories about the human condition told really well. But when I was in the emergency room, I was seeing real life. So I um, hung out a lot in the emergency room, so much so that at one point, um, the consultant for our show, who was this doctor, said, you know, I think you like it here better than you like your day job. <laughs> But I wasn't going to leave my job, and I was, I was 27, and I thought, I'm not, I'm not going to go to medical school. I wasn't even a science major undergrad. I was a French major. So, um, but eventually, I, I hung out there so much that I realized I really did need to, to make that change. So I went up to medical school. I went to Stanford, and when I was at Stanford, there was this newfangled thing called managed care, and um, it was also the middle of the, the dot-com boom and right before the bust. And a lot of my professors said, you know, I was very, very interested in guiding people through their lives as a physician and being involved in that way. And they were saying it's really hard to do in this new climate. And while I was there, my first book was published that Vicki mentioned, Stick Figure. And I, I started writing for magazines and newspapers. And so I, I realized that I could get into people's stories, these real life stories, through the lens of a journalist. And that's what I did, and I loved being a journalist. Um, but then I had a baby, and um, I realized I needed adult humans to talk to during the day. Um, and, and the UPS guy would come with all these deliveries, like you know, all the baby supplies, very often. 
And I would detain him. I would say, you know, how about those diapers? And how's the weather? And do you have kids? And he would back away to his big brown truck. And so I knew that I needed to do something different. Um, and so I called up the dean at Stanford. I, had, I used to run her mother-daughter book groups, and we were very close. And I said, maybe I should come back and do psychiatry. And she laughed at me and said, um, you know, I don't think that that's that's what you want. You can come back if you want, but I don't think that's what you want to do. I think you want these longer, deeper relationships than I think you would end up doing medication management if you became a psychiatrist. And so um, that was the best advice I ever got. That's what I did. And I sort of went, I feel like, from telling people stories as a journalist to helping people change their stories as a therapist. It's beautiful, beautiful. And that just makes me think of um, certain forms of therapy. Um, which have enjoyed uh, titles like uh, narrative therapy, future directed therapy. And I wonder how you see your work as fitting in with those where people are conceptualizing their trajectory. And I think story is how we make sense of our lives. I think it's, it's when people first come into the therapy room, the first thing they'll do is they'll tell you a story. And when I'm hearing their story, I'm not just listening to what they're saying, I'm listening to their flexibility with the story. Um, who are the major characters in their story and who are the minor characters? Who are the villains and who are the heroes? And, and is that right? Um, what are some of the faulty narratives that they've been carrying around, like I'm unlovable or nothing will ever work out for me, or in the case of one narcissistic patient that I write about in the book, I'm better than everybody else. Um, so you know, often I feel like an editor in the therapy room. And I'm listening not just to the lyrics, but to the music under the lyrics. So you're telling me this story, but what is the underlying struggle or pattern that got you into the situation in the first place? So I think we work a lot with story in the therapy room. Yeah, yeah. Without uh, being a major spoiler, can you give us a little feel for some of the characters that you chose and, and why you picked the particular types to flesh out your space? Yeah, so in, in the book... I really wanted to bring people into the therapy room with me, and I chose four people to follow, and there's actually a fifth patient, and that's me. Um, so there's four of my patients where I'm the clinician, and then there's my story where I'm the patient working with another therapist. And um, the four patients I chose are very different from one another intentionally. Um, one of them is, is the aforementioned um, person who thinks he's better than everybody else, and I call him John in the book. And he's, um, he's hard to like at first. He's very abrasive. He is very insulting to me. He tells me that he's come to see me because I'm a nobody. And he knows that he won't run into any of his high-powered colleagues in my waiting room. So I'm safe. Um, he, he pays me with, with cash. He doesn't want his, his wife to know that he's coming to therapy, so he pays me with cash. He hands me this wad of cash at the end of the session, and he, he says, you'll be like my mistress. Nobody has to know. And it gets worse because then he says, actually, not like my mistress. You're not the kind of person I choose as a mistress. More like my hooker, if you know what I mean. Um, I don't know what he means, by the way. And... Um, but but I think that I, I want to tell his story in the book because he actually, I, I think that the way people behave tells you something about where their pain is. It tells you something about the way that they're protecting themselves from the unspeakable or whatever their shame is, um, something really excruciatingly painful to them. And he really had to keep people at bay, and he was very good at doing that. But once you, once you find out what the, the tragedy and the trauma is under his behavior, he becomes the person that I think people who have read the book tend to love the most. And he becomes very human and very likable. Um, so, so I don't want to spoil any more about his story, but, but you start off where you think, why would you see this person? Why would you take this person on? Um, and it... it ends up becoming a, a really, um, I think, incredibly meaningful relationship that we develop. Um, there's another woman that we follow who is a newlywed. She, on her honeymoon, she and her husband were trying to get pregnant, and she comes back. She feels something in her breast. She thinks it's a sign of pregnancy, but it ends up being a sign of cancer. Um, they think that the breast cancer is going to be very treatable, and it is at first. And she comes to me because... Um, 
I'm not one of part of the, the cancer community. She specifically didn't want the pink ribbons and the optimism and the affirmations that didn't feel like a good approach for her. But then she comes back to me because she, at her six month scan, finds out that she has a different form of cancer that's very aggressive and it's actually terminal cancer. And um, she asked me if I'll stay with her until she dies. And the issue there is that they don't know whether it's gonna be one year or 10 years. And there's a huge difference, of course, between one year and 10 years. And I write about the experience that I have with her um, as we really have to look death in the eye and not do what I think most people do when they encounter death, which is to deny it completely, which is to say, well, you don't know, or this treatment might work, but to really say, no, this is actually the reality. And how do we talk about death? And how do we talk about living your life knowing that, um, that this is your situation and, and that it's all of our situations. One thing that I think she taught me was that, you know, life has a hundred percent mortality rate. We're all going to die. We don't know when or how, and we need to live our lives knowing that that's a healthy thing to kind of have this knowledge, this awareness of death on one shoulder, not to dwell on it, but to be aware of it. Um, I follow a young woman who is in her twenties and she keeps hooking up with the wrong guys and can't understand why she can't get into a relationship. Eventually, she ends up um, hooking up with somebody from the waiting room, um, which she thinks is a step up because she says, well, at least he's in therapy. And the problem with this is that he actually starts coming to therapy with his girlfriend. And, um, you know, and I, I, I kind of, when I open the door to the waiting room, I want to give him the eye, like, I am on to you. But I can't. And I can't talk with my colleague about, about the fact that both of our patients are hooking up with each other. So, um, you know, and, and for her, I think it, it's really about these patterns of everybody comes to therapy and they want to change. They want some kind of change. Usually they want to change somebody else, you know, like help me change my partner or my boss or my child or my parent or whatever it is. Um, and I help them to kind of, I hold up a mirror to them and help them to see their role in their circumstances and, and these patterns that they keep repeating. And, and with Charlotte in the book, that's what we work on. And she changes, she knows she wants to change, but she won't change, right? Um, so that's the, but she ultimately does. She, she also drinks too much. Um, and it's interesting too, I think, to see these people because Charlotte looks very functional. If you met her out in the world, she's extremely successful at her job. She keeps getting promoted. She has tons of friends. She's very like popular, um, but she has, all this pain, and she keeps repeating these patterns that she um, gets stuck in. Um, and then the fourth person that we follow is this woman who is about to turn 70, and she, um, her adult children won't talk to her. They're estranged from her. She's made significant mistakes as a parent, and she's had some marriages uh, in her history, and she's one of the most isolated people that I had ever met up to that point. <laughs> And she says, if things don't change in a year, I don't want to live anymore. And I think that what's interesting about her story is that when people come, I'm not just interested in, in what they're, like, why they're there. I want to know why they're there, but I also want to know why now. Why this day, this week, this month, did you call me even though this problem has been brewing for a very long time. Because I'm, I'm not only looking for what's not working, but I'm scanning for strengths. And one of the strengths that I'm scanning for is readiness. How ready are you to make changes? Why did you call now? That's a strength that you called now. Let's figure out what's behind that. So it seems like, well, what could you do in a year with this person who really had um, you know, messed up a lot of, of her life and what could change? And she changes significantly because of her readiness. And then the, the fifth patient, of course, is me. Well, so let's, <laughs> let's turn to that fifth patient a little bit and, um, you know, how that fits in the narrative you're just describing. Because, um, uh, yeah, it seems like uh, you just went for um, a quick tune-up, a few <laughs> sessions. Right. Um, and maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what it was that uh, led you to actually make that change in your own life. I know you mentioned Prochaska's stages of change theory, but... How did you make that change to the point of action and where to take you? So when I went, when I went to my therapist, I, I was very much, I did with my therapist everything that my patients do with me, which is to say that the story that I came in with was very much the story that I wanted him to agree with. So I think that a lot of us come to therapy and we have a particular story gunning for the therapist to agree with us. 
And um, I came in because the person that um, I was planning to marry told me that he had decided he didn't want to live with a kid under his roof for the next 10 years. That kid was, at the time, my eight-year-old who had not been hiding in a closet the entire time that we were dating. So my story, my version of the story, and I very intentionally say my version of the story was, well, he's a sociopath, um, and I just need to go for some crisis management and sort of get through this shocking turn of events. So when I go to the therapist and I tell him the whole story and I wait for my validation that I'm very excited to have come pouring in, because all of your friends, by the way, will say, yeah, you just, you dodged a bullet. This is, you know, they, they will agree with you. And, and that's the difference, I think, between what I talk about in the book between idiot compassion and wise compassion, which are these Buddhist terms. But idiot compassion is what we do with our friends. You're right. You know, your boss is a jerk or you're right. Your partner shouldn't have done that. Um, that doesn't really help. It feels good in the short term. But when your friend has gotten into that same situation, say, nine other times, you know, wise compassion might help. What a therapist will do is offer you that wise compassion. So they, they will actually help you to look at something else that might be going on. So I think I'm just there for crisis management, and I tell him the boyfriend's story. And he tells me that... Um, he thinks that I'm grieving something bigger. He, he gloms onto this one statement where I say, and now I've just spent all these years, you know, dating this person, and now it was a waste, and I'm in my 40s, and, uh, you know, half my life is over. And he just gloms onto that statement, half my life is over. And that ends up what, what our therapy ends up being about, which is this, this question of what's happening to me in midlife and this search for sort of meaning and what you can change and what you can't change and going into this place of uncertainty. Um, and so I think that that was very much not what I thought I was going into therapy for, but it's what I needed to be in therapy for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it, it strikes me that that's a process of um, facing reality, a demystification process, and you talk about pulling back the curtain. It made me think of the Wizard of Oz and uh, the value of, um, learning that therapists are not necessarily wizards, um, but that they can be good people and, or as you would say, good humans. So can you tell us a little bit more about that and how that may help people to uh, access therapy? Right. One of the things I wanted to do with this book was to demystify what therapy is. There are so many misconceptions about what therapy, what the process actually entails. Some people think that it means that you go in and you talk about your childhood ad nauseum and you never leave, um, which is not what therapy is. If we talk about your childhood, it's simply, you know, it's not to blame anybody and it's, and it's not to re-traumatize you. It's simply to say, hey, here's what happened and here's how it impacts the way you act now in the present so that you can do something different in the future. And we're very much aware of helping people to struggle less as quickly as possible. So we don't want to keep you there forever. We actually want to encourage your independence and help you not to have to come to us. Worst business model ever, by the way, <laughs> but, but very much what we do. Um, so that's one misconception. And I think another misconception is that you come in and you talk about your problems and then you leave and then you come back next week and it's sort of like stuck in amber, like, you know, nothing happens outside the therapy room. And we like to say that insight is the booby prize of therapy, that if you come in and you have some kind of aha moment or you come to more awareness in the therapy room, but you don't make any changes when you leave our office in that time between sessions, the insight is useless. So you can say, yes, now I understand that I, why I get into arguments with my, with my wife um, in my marriage. But if you leave our office and you don't do anything different, you do exactly the same thing at home, there's no point for you to be in therapy. You're, nothing's going to change. So we really want to help you make changes based on what you're learning about yourself in the therapy room. And you can bet that what somebody does with a the therapist in the therapy room is very much some version of what they're doing out there in the world. And we want to help them see that so they can, they can make those changes first in the therapy room and then outside. Yeah. Um. One of the things that was really striking is how, um, you know, in that in that process, y you address people and what is real, um, and identify the source of most people's discontent as not accepting the reality and and the therapist role as a mirror of the real process. Um, 
Yeah. And it, it just brings to mind the expression that you used and had as a chapter heading, which is, if the queen had balls, she'd be the king. Yes. So I wonder if you could elaborate on that for the audience. So many times people feel trapped. Um, they come in and they're trapped by their childhoods, their fears, their circumstances, uh, the people in their lives. And that's not to say that those things aren't real. You know, there are, there are lots of difficult people in the world and lots of difficult circumstances. But our response to them can also contribute to our difficulty and our struggle. So... Um, my therapist um, brought up this cartoon. He said, you know, at one point when I was going on and on about the boyfriend, um, he said, you know, it's like, it's like this cartoon where there's this, this prisoner shaking the bars, desperately trying to get out, but on the right and the left, it's open. And, and I, I love that. I actually went from, my, from his office to my office and repeated that five sessions straight right after that. Um, and everybody responded to that. And I use it all the time. So, you know, for my, it, it's kind of like I got, I got some lessons in therapy from my therapist. But, but I think that's so powerful because so many times we, we feel like we can't get out of a situation. But really, we do have choices. But we have to look. We have to see that it's open on the right or the left. And so many of us don't want to do that because we kind of don't want the freedom because with freedom comes responsibility. And one of the main tasks of therapy is to help people to take responsibility for their lives. That whatever your circumstances are, you do have choices um, in terms of how you respond to your circumstances and in terms of how you you have agency and you orchestrate your your world and how you navigate yourself through the world. So, um, you know, I think it's really important for people to understand that therapy is really hard work, not just for the therapist, but for the patient, that it's really important that you're working in there. And if you're not working, if you're just coming to, you know, retell the, the story of the week, that's not what therapy is. At the same time, thinking about how much work is it, you say therapy is like pornography. So can you help us understand that, how you reconcile those things? How is it like pornography? I I think it's like pornography in the sense that um, so many people go to therapy who won't admit it, um, or they don't talk about it. Um, You know, there's kind of a thrill to it. Um, There's a there's a thrill to what happens in that room. A lot of people imagine that it's it's kind of all doom and gloom in that room, and it's not at all. I think there's so many heroic moments in the therapy room where people are doing something that they weren't capable of doing before. There are all these small moments that that people um, that happen in the therapy room that nobody else sees. And when people take those moments and they they bring them to their lives outside, it's even more heroic. And these are people who thought that they would never change or that things would never change. And yet, with a lot of work, they do. So I think that there's a lot of, um, and I think there's stigma around therapy, just like there's stigma around pornography. So I think that they're both, they're things that people keep very secret. There's a lot of shame. And yet, there are lots of people who who do it anyway. Yeah, so uh, tell us a little bit about how you think your work is going to change the accessibility of, of therapy because I think that's what I see as a you know overarching virtue of the work is that it really does increase people's access and, and demystify the process. Well, like you were saying about being the wizard, I don't think we want to be wizards. And so somebody had asked me in an interview, are other therapists upset that you wrote this book because now they'll know what you're thinking and you're feeling and why you're doing what you're doing in that moment? And I say, no, it's quite the opposite. I think, I think most clinicians are really glad that we're humanizing what we do because therapy is ultimately a very rich human experience. And in fact, study after study shows that more important to the success of someone's therapy than even our training or the number of years of experience we've had or the modality that we use is the relationship that the person has with their therapist. And so we want that to be a very human experience. And what's really, I think, interesting about it is that there's a chapter in the book called Embarrassing Public Encounters, which is what happens when we we encounter our patients outside of the therapy room. And I think it can be uncomfortable not only for the patient, but it can be really uncomfortable for the therapist, too. Um, My most embarrassing experience was when I ran into a patient in the bra department of a department store. (laughs) And the the, um, sales clerk who was helping me said really loudly over my dressing room door, we found the miracle bra on a 34A, ma'am, right next to my patient. (laughs) Now you all know my bra size, by the way. But so does my patient. It was extraordinarily awkward. Um, But I I think in other instances, I have a colleague who 
was was she and her husband were trying to get she was trying to get pregnant and they had they had, had failure after failure and she was finally pregnant and she was standing in a Starbucks when her physician called and told her that her pregnancy wasn't viable and she burst into tears in Starbucks and one of her patients happened to walk in and see her made eye contact with her left and never came back to therapy and so I think there's this this weird relationship where we want our therapist to be human. Nobody wants to talk to a brick wall. Nobody wants to go to a robot. We want someone who has lived life, but at the same time, we don't want to see that. We don't want to see their humanity, even though our humanity is our greatest tool in helping people. Yeah, I think it really brings up an issue about, um, you know, what are the boundaries that need to be established in the therapeutic relationship? And we probably, how many therapists we got out here? Psychologists, psychiatrists, yeah, you got it pretty decent crowd there. So yeah. I wonder if you know you could address that a little bit on that professional level. Of, and and I, I just love the one little piece you had on uh, namaste in bed. I wonder if you could oh. mention that as well in terms of self-disclosure. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was an instance where I didn't disclose. I, I, I accidentally, uh, after the, the morning after the breakup, I had two um, things on my bed. One was the, the gray... Um, sweater that I was going to wear to work. The other was my pajama top that said namaste in bed um, that was also gray. And I accidentally put that one on because I was in this blur and I went to the office like that and then realized it when I got to the office, but it was too late to do anything about it. It looked like a t-shirt, right? So, I mean, it didn't look like I was wearing my pajamas, but it wasn't the kind of thing I would normally wear to work, needless to say. Um, and... Um, yeah, I did not disclose sort of, you know, why I was wearing that. Um, but I think there are other instances where you do. One of the, one of the best lessons I think I got in self-disclosure was my very first session. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. And in medical school, they, they have this saying, see one, do one, teach one, which is you, um, you see someone, say, put in an IV, then you do one yourself, then you teach somebody else how to do it. Um, it's trial by fire, and very much I think the same thing with therapists, that you have seen a lot of therapy being done. You've watched videotapes. You've looked through one-way mirrors. You've, um, you know, you've done role plays of therapy sessions. But when you actually get in a room for the very first time with somebody, it's a whole different ballgame. So my first patient was at a clinic, and my job was to do an intake. All I had to do was get these answers on this intake form. Now, I had been a journalist for over a decade. This was going to be a piece of cake as far as I was concerned. I didn't know what all the other interns were so nervous about. It's like, it's a form. You ask the questions. You get it filled out. <laughs> so I go into the room, and my um, this woman comes in. She's about 30, and she says that the reason she's there is that she can't stop crying. And then as if on cue, she starts crying. And by crying, I don't mean like the warm-up and then, you know, it's like a tsunami. She's, she's, she's bawling. And if you've ever, we were like this far apart, except on the same level. And if you've ever sat with somebody who's crying, it's uncomfortable. But if you've ever sat with a stranger who's crying and you don't know anything about the person yet, you don't know why she's crying, you don't know anything about her history, um, I didn't know what to do. I don't know, should I look at her to let her know that I'm there with her? Or will that make her feel self-conscious? Should I look away so that she doesn't feel self-conscious? Should I stop her at some point because she was going on and on and on? Uh, this was not how it went, by the way, in grad school. These were not like how our, how our training sessions went. And I just, I felt utterly useless. I wanted my supervisor in the room. I needed therapy at that moment. I needed someone to help me. Um, but I wasn't, you know, and then she starts talking about what's going on. I wasn't getting any answers for my intake form. I look at the clock to see how much time I have left to get these answers, and about 10 minutes have passed. And I think, no, surely more than 10 minutes have passed. But I sort of follow where she's going. I'm a little bit nervous about whether I can get fired from this gig on the first day because I have gotten none of these questions answered. And I'm trying to follow what she's saying and try to get to know her a little bit. And I look back at the clock, 10 minutes have passed. Their batteries in the clock have died. I have no idea how much time has passed. <laughs> and, and I don't know whether it's been, I don't know, so now I have a real sense of the rhythm of a session. I could tell you probably, you know, like in my head how much time has passed without looking at the clock. But I had no idea. Maybe it was 60 minutes. Maybe it was 30 minutes. I really don't know. And my second new patient, my second very new patient, is in the waiting room. And I don't know when it's time. So do I arbitrarily say, oh, I'm sorry, our time is up? <laughs> you know, I don't know how long it's been. And then she finally says, 
oh, is it over already? That went so fast. And I follow her gaze, and I look behind me. On the wall behind me is a clock that I didn't know existed. Um, and I went to my supervisor, kind of tail between my legs, and I said I didn't get any of the answers for this intake form. I didn't know what time it was. I don't know if she knew. Um, and the first thing my supervisor said to me was, you need to be authentic in the room. That if, if you, the battery was out in the clock, you tell her, hey, this clock isn't working. I don't want to get distracted. Let me go get a clock, and I'll be right back. And I think that was, that was such a valuable lesson in terms of self-disclosure, was you can say things like that, which I didn't know. Um, and, and I think that you learn a lot about, you know, what you can say and what you can't say. And I think we make very intentional decisions about what we're going to share about ourselves and what we're not. And, and usually we're not going to, but there are times when we will. An example is um, a colleague of mine has a son who has Tourette syndrome, and she was seeing someone whose son had Tourette syndrome. And this person felt very isolated in her experience in terms of the challenges of what she was going through. And the therapist did disclose that she had a son. She didn't talk about her own son in the therapy, but she disclosed that she did have that experience. And it was so helpful for this client to know that the therapist truly understood the day-to-day -day of what she was going through. You know, one thing that comes to mind is how your focus on relationships as being a core element in therapy can play out in your own life as a, as a person. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that, about how your experience as a therapist has impacted some of your decision making um, as you've gone through from the time the book begins with the yeah. breakup of a relationship through the development of others. Yeah, I think that, that going through therapy, it's different when you're getting licensed and you have to do your 500 hours of therapy because you still feel very much like the patient at that point. But once you've been in practice for a while um, and then you go back to therapy, it's hard to take your therapist hat off. And yet you do everything with your therapist that your patients do with you. I wanted my therapist to like me. Um, when I would leave and I'd see this other woman who looks so nice and put together in the waiting room when I would leave, I'd think, oh, I wonder if he likes her sessions better or if, you know, <laughs> he dreads my sessions. Um, you know, I Googled him one night. He told me that I needed to stop Google stalking the boyfriend, and he said I needed to do something different. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I was about to type in the boyfriend's name, and then I thought, no, I'm going to interrupt this, this neurological pathway, and I'm going to stop and not do it. And then before I knew it, I was typing in my therapist's name because I had never Googled him before I had seen him. I didn't do the research. He was a referral. Um, and, you know, I had been a journalist before that, so I was really good at, at going down that Internet rabbit hole and finding, because there wasn't really that much on the surface about him. Um, my, a colleague of mine likes to call the Internet um, the most effective non-prescription uh, non short-term painkiller out there. And that was very much what I was doing that night. Um, but I did find out that his father had died at, you know, youngish, like in middle age, um, who, and he had been a marathon runner, and he had died suddenly of a heart attack. And I had been waxing poetic in my therapy sessions about my close relationship with my own father and how I was so glad that I would have this time with him um, to really have these goodbyes and talk about, you know, just really enjoy each other in this way. And I... I suddenly felt very self-conscious about the fact that I had been talking about that because now I knew that he had had this other experience. And I didn't want to tell him that I had Google stalked him because that's really embarrassing. Um, and yet I knew, I was worried that I would slip up too because my patients inevitably slip up with me. They'll say things like, well, you know what it's like to raise a boy who's in middle school, even though I've never mentioned that I'm a parent or that I have a boy or how old he is. Um, so they slip up all the time. And I, I was really editing myself in the therapy room, and eventually I told him that I had Googled him. And, um, and I eventually also told him the extent of it. <laughs> um, and, but it wasn't that I found anything, anything strange. It was just that when you know something about someone, it changes the dynamic in the room. And, but all the air returned to the room when I told him this. And we were able to talk about my experience of learning this about his father and how that impacted how I was talking about my father. And I thought that was, it actually deepened our conversation about fathers and my relationship with my own father. Something. Now there's another point when you mention, um, and again, this is for the therapists in the crowd, a little bit more technical. You quote Bion um, and talk about his expression of uh, without memory or desire 
um, and what that means. Um, can you tell us or share with us a little more what you're thinking about that? One of my supervisors when I was training was a Beyond enthusiast. And um, one of one thing that I think it gets misinterpreted, but Beyond talked about entering each session with no memory, no desire, meaning no memory of what happened before and no desire, meaning you're not trying to guide your patient in a certain direction um, because that would be your desire, not theirs. And um, I, I found that impossible to do um, because I, I, I thought, you know, you, I, I personally want to remember a lot about what happened before because it informs what I'm doing next. It's almost like I used to compete in chess tournaments when I was a kid, and you'd have to think five moves ahead, and we're always thinking five moves ahead in the therapy room. That fifth move might not happen for two months, um, but it's there, and you look for those opportunities in every session, and you're planting the seeds. And one thing we don't want to do is we don't want to go in too early because people are already, they have a defense up for a reason, and it's to protect them. And if you try to um, dismantle that too early, they're going to build a wall that's even higher, and then it's going to take even longer to get to the place you want to get with them because now you have to scale that second part of the wall as well. Um, so no memory, no desire, just um, it didn't work for me um, as a clinician, but I, I know that there are people who, who really try to do that, um, not literally, but I think in, in some kind of, with the spirit of what it means. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you also mentioned a dream that you have at uh, some point that's uh, writing a book about your own death. Um, and you also told me that you wrote this book instead of writing a book on happiness. So this made me wonder, what does it mean to you and all the other things you're doing? Because you're writing a column, you're doing therapy, and you're writing these books. What does it mean to you to write a book? And why did you write this one now? Um, so I, this was not the book I was supposed to write. I, I can't imagine anyone waking up and saying, I'm going to write a book about myself in therapy. And I can't imagine any therapist waking up and, and, and thinking that. I was supposed to be writing a book. Um, I'd written a piece, a cover story for The Atlantic called How to Land Your Kid in Therapy, and the subtitle was Why Our Obsession with Our Kids' Happiness May Be Dooming Them to Unhappy Adulthoods. Um, it spread like wildfire, and every publisher wanted me to write that book. Um, and I can say this only because of what I ultimately did, but you know, they offered me this astronomical sum to write this book, and any person in their right mind would say, yes, it would be an easy book to write. It was an extraordinary sum of money. Um, but I said no, <laughs> kind of like Bartleby the Scrivener. I would prefer not to. And um, with equally tragic results, I should say, um, in the sense that um, I, I, I just, I felt like it, it, it wasn't, I felt like there were a lot of books about helicopter parenting, and I didn't want to just jump on that commercial bandwagon and write this book. And I think that had a lot to do with what I later discovered in therapy about my search for meaning and wanting to do something really meaningful and not wanting to waste whatever time I had um, in the second half of my life doing things that didn't feel um, fulfilling or meaningful or contributing to the world in some way. Um, and so I said no to that, but um, I ended up getting under contract to write this book about why our obsession with our own happiness might be dooming us to unhappy adulthoods. But my heart wasn't in it because it didn't reflect anything that I was seeing in the therapy room. And I felt like um, every day I would try to sit down and write this book that I was now under contract to write and that was paying for my internship. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I, I didn't really know what to do. And there, I had so much shame around the fact that I couldn't write this book. And every day, it was, I was almost like the closet gambler who gets dressed and, and kisses her spouse goodbye and goes to the casino instead of the office. I was My casino was Facebook or writing fabulously witty emails to the boyfriend um, in the book. And I just, I couldn't write the book. And I ended up canceling that contract. I didn't know what I was going to write next. But, um, but ultimately, because what I wanted to do the whole time was bring people into the therapy room, I thought, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And that was the, the genesis of this book. And I think what you were talking about with dreams was often dreams, um, they tell us something about something that hasn't yet come to the surface, but that we're, is kind of percolating beneath the surface. Um, I think that so many times, not only do we people come to therapy with secrets that they're keeping from the world or from the people close to them, but they're also keeping secrets from the therapist, and they're also keeping secrets from themselves. 
And our, I was keeping lots of secrets from my therapist, but partly because I was keeping those secrets from myself. So at myself, I wasn't really ready to face them. And so in the book, there are like these two major confessions that come out. Um, one of which I start to, it starts to come to the surface through a dream. Um, but I still don't tell my therapist, even when I'm aware of it. Um, and the other one, um, I'm aware of, but I'm too embarrassed to tell him about it. And I, Carl Jung calls secrets psychic poison. And I think that's because they're so corrosive um, and they're all, all about shame. And there's a difference, by the way, between privacy and secrecy. So privacy, we all need. It's healthy. We have our private thoughts and we don't need to mind melt with everybody else and share every thought or feeling that we have. But secrecy comes from a place of shame. And a lot of what happens in, in therapy is people have a lot of shame around things. A lot of times men especially will come in and say, I've never told anybody this before. And I'm waiting for this, what I think is going to be this incredibly vulnerable thing that they're about to tell me. And it's something that seems so mild to me. Um, because I think that men really can't talk to other people about something that feels emotionally vulnerable to them. Women will come in and say, in terms of their secrets, they'll say, um, I've never told anybody this before, except for my mother, my sister, and my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> and then what they tell me is actually pretty significant, right? Um, so I think that what we do in therapies, we try to also, I think we're all sort of struggling with a lot of the same things, but we don't know it because we won't talk to each other about it. Um, you know, I um, <clears throat> it was mentioned earlier that I, I've done this research on creativity, and I think that you clearly have a talent um, uh, that you're what we would call big C creative um, and have shown this across multiple areas. Um, and the question that we always ask our big C creatives is, of all the things you've done, of what are you the most proud? So I wonder if you could share that with us. Being a mother. Yeah. Um, I so. think being a parent takes so much creativity. Um, it's, I used to do improv, and I think parenting is the ultimate um, act of improvisation. <laughs> um, you know, lots of yes and <laughs> going on there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think creativity, though, is, is a way of being. I think so many people, too, will talk in therapy about lost dreams, like lost dreams of creativity. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a this or I wanted to be a that, and I'm a this and that instead. Lawyer, by the way, um, <laughs> is what they are instead. Um, but I think that there, there can be so much creativity in just the way that you approach life. And if you don't have curiosity about yourself or the world around you, the therapy won't help you. But I also think that you go through life in kind of a stunted way if you don't have curiosity about yourself and the world around you. And I think that's where creativity comes from. It comes from a place of curiosity. Oh, what about that? Or, oh, can we look at it from this person's perspective? So many times, when going back to story, when people tell me their stories, I want to know who are the major characters and who are the minor characters. And if the other characters in the story you're telling me were to tell their version of the story, what would it sound like? And so many times, it opens up this whole new world, not only emotionally for them, but I think in terms of just creatively looking at life differently. And if you can broaden your lens, I think you will go through life in a much more creative way. And I think people find more meaning and fulfillment when they go through life that way. Mm -hmm. to, to do that, you've actually um, dropped a number of things that most people would feel, oh, I've got to stick with this. You just described the book contracts, you know, leaving you know, these fabulously successful shows and major studios, et cetera. Um, how did you become so fearless? What do you attribute it to? Oh, I don't think I was fearless at all. I think at the time, my story was that I was either you know, very... Um, <laughs> very, very versatile or very confused, um, and probably a little bit of both. I wasn't fearless, but I, but I also think it, it goes a little bit into change. So many people come to therapy and they say, I want to change. First they say, I want to change others, but then when they get to the point where they want to change themselves, um, people know, often they know exactly what they need to do, what kind of changes they need to make. The question is, why don't they? Why don't we, I would say, as people, why don't we do the thing that we know we need to do. And it's because with change comes loss. And I think people don't realize that even positive change, so all these changes that I made, um, even when you're leaving something 
for something that seems better, you're giving up something familiar. And we tend to cling to the familiar because at least we know it. So even if the thing familiar to you is unpleasant or even downright miserable, it's hard to let it go. It's hard to leave it because we're going into uncertainty. And as humans, we don't like uncertainty. Uncertainty is very anxiety provoking for us. So I wasn't fearless when I was making these changes, but I think that it was a good, um, it was a good foundation for the things that came next because ultimately I couldn't see it at the time, but every single thing that I did, um, you know, I went from, from dealing with story and the human condition in all these different ways to a place where now I'm doing it um, through my private practice, through my advice column, which is not really advice, it's more um, looking at um, somebody's problem through the lens of a therapist. Um, and through the writing of the book, I think they, they all um, are in conversation with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, you know, people are often fascinated by that kind of process that you deploy. And you know, it's interesting to think about that process as you apply it across these different disciplines. Um, and I was just wondering if you could share with us a little bit about how do you do it? How do you write a column, write books, do therapy three days a week, um, and then, of course, raising your son? Um, this is quite a, a full plate. So. I think women are asked that question so much. How do you do it all? And the fact is, what is the other option? <laughs> what, what is our choice? Um, Go to bed. You know, well, you can't because you're doing all these things. And I think if you want to have vitality in your life, if you want to live a dynamic life, you, a lot of women, you know, on the one hand, we're pulled in all these different directions. And on the other hand, I think we tend to want to do them all very well. And one of the things I help people in therapy um, look at is, is not being such a perfectionist about it. Um, if I tried to be a perfectionist in everything I did, I would fail miserably. I make mistakes in my practice, right? And you have another week and you can go back and you can repair it um, or talk about it. Um, you know, I, I went through two books I turned down before I got to this book. Um, you know, there are so many ways that, um, and I, my son will attest to, I make a million mistakes on a daily basis as a parent. <laughs> so, um, so I think that it's about saying, these are the things that I want to do in my life and I'm going to do what Winnicott called, you know, being the good enough parent, being good enough. Um, and, and following what you want to do. We waste so much time, I think, being unkind to ourselves, being critical. I had a, a, a patient write down all of the things that she said to herself during the week, and she was so embarrassed when she came back. She said, I'm a bully. I'm, like, horrible to myself. I would never say this to my friends, right? Um, so I think part of it is about having self-compassion, which doesn't mean not taking responsibility for yourself. One of the main things we try to do is help people take responsibility for their lives, but you don't have to self-flagellate as you do that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, well, to help us all avoid self-flagellation, what kind of advice do you have for uh, other therapists um, out in the audience? Um, you know, I belong to a consultation group, and I think it's incredibly valuable. I write about it in, in the book. I really wanted people to see the full life of a therapist, which I think people think, like, you exist in a room. Um, and I think our patients think that too. It's in Embarrassing Public Encounters, that chapter I mentioned. Um, I talk about how weird it is. Like, it's almost like when you're in first grade and, and you all of a sudden see your teacher in Best Buy and she's got like a family and, and she's like in cutoff shorts and like she's, you know, and you think like, wait, she doesn't sleep in the classroom. I think a lot of people think that like we sleep on the couch in our therapy room or they don't want to know anything about what happens when we leave. Um, but I think, you know, so I take people into the kitchen when we're like talking in between sessions. I take people into my consultation group where I talk about a patient that I'm really having trouble with and I can't seem to help. Um, I think consultation groups are, are critical um, in terms of really having a place where you can talk about, hey, this is where I'm stuck or this isn't working. Or the one thing people don't talk about too is that in any other job, I think you either have a work, pro a work product that you, you produce that people see and you get feedback on it, or you're working on a team and people give you feedback along the way. When you're a therapist, not only do you not get feedback on what you can do better, but nobody says, like, that thing you said in, in minute 30, that was amazing, <laughs> right? Nobody says that to you. You can see what's happening with your client. But I think in a consultation group, you get a lot of feedback that you don't get working alone in a room with somebody else. Yeah. Um, also, since we have a lot of therapists here, um, and how many writers are there, by the way? 
Wow. Well, and you see those hands don't go up as quickly as the therapist's hands. Yeah. But, but, uh, um, well, I just want to say that when, I, when I'm out in the world and people say, what do you do? And I have to make that choice. Do I say I'm a therapist or I'm a writer? I say I'm a writer, and here's why. Because if you say you're a therapist, people have very odd reactions to that. Um, you know, they'll either say, like, um, they'll either hightail it for, like, a drink, you know, like, where I'm out of here. Um, you know, or, or one time a couple got into a fight with me right in front. You know, I was, they said, like, oh, do you see couples? And I said, yeah, I see a lot of couples. And the woman said, see? And the guy kind of looked at it. They got into this, like, fight in front of me. I'm the one who hightailed for a drink in that situation. <laughs> but but I think they'll say things like, you know, oh, are you gonna are you gonna psychoanalyze me? Which is a really weird thing to say because if I were a gynecologist, nobody would say, like, are you gonna give me a pelvic exam right now? So I always choose writer. Um, when people ask me in a in a strange situation like that, what I do for a living. So what advice do you have for the writers? Write. That's my advice. I would yeah, say sure. I would say my best that advice is. is don't compare yourself to other people. I think writers are are it's so hard, I think especially in Los Angeles, but I think in general, I think writers compare themselves constantly and um and I think that that is toxic to the creative process. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. And that's totally consistent with all of our creativity research so far. And there you uh go. yeah. But speaking of which, our audience is a very creative bunch and I think we are um, in receipt of a number of questions that are coming from the audience. And so we're going to get some, some cards coming up here. Yes. Um, in your envelopes are the index cards. First of all, thank you to Bob and Lori. Such an illuminating discussion. I know we could sit here all evening and listen to the two of you, but as you said, we have some questions coming from the audience, so please pass your index cards to the aisle, and we will. somebody will come by to pick them up. Um, and uh, what, a, what a wonderful treat that you gave us, and such an insight into therapy. I feel like I just had a wonderful therapy session listening to the two of you. Um, it's really sharing your knowledge and your expertise and your insights with all of us. I'm just upset that we didn't get to study your brain in our big C exceptional creativity I uh, project. Would be very afraid. Oh, yeah? Yes. <laughs> Get a little claustrophobic in the scanner? Oh, no. no. I just mean <laughs> having, having your brain analyzed like that. Really? I'm joking. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, I mean, maybe you could just mention when you were um, you know, seeing a scan for the first time, that's one of the things that I thought motivated you to become a, a therapist. Oh, yeah. yeah to well, get was... under the hood there. Right, I was I was hold, hold, I was holding the retractor for um, in a brain surgery, and I thought seeing an actual brain was was incredible. It was incredible to actually see. Yeah, good stuff. Um, so we've got a bunch of great questions. Um, and I like this one. When you say that therapy is work, what does work mean? Mm. So one of my one of my colleagues likes to say, "I don't do you go girl therapy." Which, which means that therapy is work. If you're there for some sympathetic head nodding, that's, you're probably in the wrong place. Um, if you are there because, um, you know, again, you think you're just going to, like, you're treating it like, um, like yoga, you know, <laughs> like you're going to kind of come every week and get your emotional workout and leave, um, that's probably not going to benefit you that much. It requires you to see yourself in a way that you normally prefer not to be seen. Um, and then to take that and not to judge yourself, but to take that and use that to relate differently to yourself and to relate differently to the people in your life. And I think therapy, one thing that it does is it makes you more compassionate toward yourself and ultimately, I think, more compassionate toward other people. But you really have to be mindful of um, taking that knowledge and using it in your life. And it's hard work. It's hard work, I think, even in the therapy room to not, you know, there, people always say, like, I wonder if I'm boring my therapist. Um, when we look at the clock 
It is not because you're boring us. It's because we want to put you together. If you're like talking about something hard or intense, we, we don't want to be like, and now, see you later. Um, you know, we want to have five or 10 minutes to kind of put you together. The boring patients are the ones who keep you at bay. They're the ones that won't let you in. They won't share their lives with you. They, they, you try to, you try to, connect with them and they run away from you and they'll, you know, look over here, look over here, look over here. Um, that gets very boring. <coughs> so it's hard work. You have to not be that patient in the room. It's hard. Um, somewhat connected to that. Um, someone in the audience has pointed out the therapy that you describe is available to a very small percentage of the population. And the need, however, is great, even those without means. Um, and so in the course of making therapy more accessible, how do we make this process available to the, all those who need it in a, in a way um, you know, uh, that will help uh, many more and increase access, especially those with chronic mental illness and mm -hmm. severe distress? If I had the answer to the healthcare situation in our country, um, I, I would love to have that answer. I think it's not just mental health. I think that healthcare is not very accessible to people. Um, we have high deductibles. We have um, limited networks um, for all of our health care. Um, I think for people, you know, one thing we do have is we have low-fee clinics where I trained, where most therapists train, and they're supervised by licensed clinicians. Um, that's an option for people, but I, 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 I don't know the answer. I, I have a sliding scale, and I have limited sliding scale spots, but not everybody, you know, you can't see everybody on a sliding scale. So... Um, I don't have a good answer for that. I think it's incredibly unfortunate. And I hope that people, you know, do reach out and do go to a clinic if they can't be in private practice because um, I think that you can really benefit from, from the clinics. I, you know, even though we weren't that experienced, we were, we were supervised in, in a really um, rigorous way. And I think it's a, it's a good place for people to start. Well, there have been a couple of questions wanting to know if you're taking on any new patients. <laughs> Not at the moment. <laughs> oh, well. Um, uh, and, uh, there's also a couple of linked questions um, about the feelings about your disclosure in the book um, uh, on the part of your parents and your son. Mm. So the bi-directional questions yeah. about those relationships and what's, what's been their response? Sure. Um, my son um, got to read all of his portions before they were published, um, and he got to approve and edit. Um, and um, he's, uh, he's, he's interesting. Um, he was, like, extremely um, – he really didn't have any edits. He, uh, he was fine with his parts. And one of the chapters about – he's not really in the book very much um, – one of the chapters is, is called How Kids Deal with Grief. And there's a lot of, of different layers of loss and grief in the book. And I don't just mean death. I mean all kinds of loss. Um, you know, there are these sort of silent losses, like people have a miscarriage, but they didn't lose uh, an eight-year-old. And I think, you know, I had a breakup, but I, it wasn't a divorce. And um, how do you deal with that? I had to explain to my son that, um, that my boyfriend and I were breaking up. And there's a chapter about how that scene where I explained that to him and how kids deal with grief. And he read that now at 13 instead of at 8 when, um, you know, when it actually happened. So um, I had his permission. My parents, um, I didn't show them the parts about them. There are two chapters where they are. Um, one is called Mothers and one is called Fathers. And, um, you know, I, I think what... I think they're very loving chapters. I think that one of the things that I went through in therapy was really, what is your relationship like with your parents at midlife? How is it different from the relationship that you had growing up, no matter what kind of relationship it was? Um, and I think that you, you relate differently to your parents. You know they're not going to be around forever. And I think that you, you come to be an adult with your parents as opposed to the child who did or did not get whatever you may or may not have wanted. Um, and it was really sort of, a, I think, a coming to terms with me as the adult and um, having this time with my parents to have a different kind of relationship with them in the time that we have left. 
And on a related theme, what about your patients' reactions? And right. So I that think that's well. that we maybe should have mentioned at the beginning. So um, I didn't write about anybody that I was currently seeing because I didn't think that I could write about people at the same time that I was doing the work with them. I felt like it would it would affect the work and contaminate the work in a lot of ways. And I got permission um, from these people to use their stories. Um, and I changed, obviously, anything that you could Google, um, which was hard. And I should mention, um, even things like when I did Google my therapist, the one thing that I did find was that he had a Yelp review. Um, and what was interesting about that was the person gave him a rave. Um, this person really liked him, but she had given everything else like one star, and they were all, you know, all caps, and everybody was disappointing her, and nobody could please her. And I thought, wow, she really does need therapy. Um, and but you could see then when she gave this five stars to my therapist. Um, she then she started giving more positive reviews to she would review like everything everywhere she went no matter what it was and she gave more positive reviews and I thought wow my therapist is doing a great job with her because she's less judgmental she's more able to see other people's perspectives but one of the things I had to change was um, was that she complained about when she was at a beach that she had stepped on something that um, that injured her foot um, and. It seemed like just another complaint of hers. It was so funny what it was, and I wish that I could have used it, but I couldn't because it was Googleable. So I had to say it was a rock, um, which was not as funny. Um, <laughs> but the point is, I changed everything, even people who were not my patients, even this Yelper, I changed because I didn't want people to go and find her Yelp reviews. Right, right. Um, I have to mention, just because you were talking about those Yelp reviews, the second law of psychodynamics. Are you familiar with that? No? It's based, you know, following the laws of physics, but for every overvaluation, there's an equal and opposite <laughs> devaluation. Um, but yeah, I guess there were, there were questions about how synthetic are the characters, how um, much are they straight on subtle revisions, or are they constructed? Um, and it sounds like from what you're saying that they're pretty real people. Yeah, I mean, I had to change the, the specific details, um, but I stayed very true to the spirit of of each story, and as an example with John, the, the, um, the person who is very abrasive at the beginning and who comes to be somebody very lovable, um, at one point he says to me, um, I, um, you know, I can't make it today, so um, here's my Skype and um, I'll, you know, we'll Skype at three. He never asked me, you know, do you do Skype sessions? Is this okay? Um, uh, and I don't want to do the Skype session with him. Um, a, a colleague of mine calls Skype, um, she says it's like doing therapy with a condom on because <laughs> it's not the same experience as the physical energy in the room with somebody. Um, but that, that very much happened that way, that Skype session. And I, I recount it in, in, in a lot of detail almost exactly as it happened. I had to change like very few details. So what you're reading is pretty accurate. Well, we got some personal questions. You can just, you know, say no. No, but, uh, I'll tell you right now, no. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, never mind that. No. Well, we'll we'll see. Um, uh, are you still in therapy with Wendell? Oh, um, yes. I, so in the book, in the book, <laughs> I I leave, um, but I I, st I don't see him weekly, but I do go to therapy, and he is the therapist that I go to when I go. Mm-hmm. And uh, this one, this one is really something. What, what is your birth order in your family? <laughs> I love that. Um, I am the Someone's I'm got the a younger. hypothesis. Yeah, someone has a hypothesis. I don't know if this will hew to the hypothesis, but I'm the younger one. <laughs> You're the younger one. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, Everyone's like, oh, that makes sense. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, um, how do you measure progress? or success in patients who have chronic mental health conditions? Mm -hmm. I think that one thing that most people want out of, out of life is they want to they love and they want to be loved. And they want to learn how to do that. And sometimes people didn't get good modeling and sometimes they have mental health conditions that have prevented them from knowing how to do that or how to, how to manage relationship with a mental health condition. Um, and I think that um, progress is when things look different, when 
you do something differently, when you're able to um, be in relationship in a way that um, is less fraught, goes more smoothly, feels better. And you know, people with mental health conditions do that all the time. Mm -hmm. And when folks feel they're not making progress in therapy, what are the kinds of yeah. things that you do to unstick them or help them get through that? I think we have to ask ourselves, you know, we have to understand more about why they, why they feel like they're not making progress. Um, we have to assess, are, do we feel like they're making progress? And if, if they're not making progress, we want to understand what we can be doing differently to help them. And the, the case that I mentioned in the book is this woman who, she comes in every week, tells me how ineffective I am, um, but doesn't want to leave. <laughs> um, and so it's like, you know, so if you're not making progress, and, and I, I talk about her in my case consultation group every week um, in terms of, you know, what can I do differently? And ultimately, I fail in the sense of I couldn't find a way in with her, and I have to break up with her. I've never had to do that, never had to do it up to that point, never have had to do it since. Um, but I do end the therapy because I feel like I'm wasting her time. I don't feel like um, she's making any progress. And... Um, you know, I think we're always assessing progress. We're always assessing, you know, we're doing two things. One is we're, we're trying to help them see something more quickly, but we also, um, we also can't move them along farther than they're willing to go. So we have to try to get in there and figure out a way to, to move things along. Here's one that was connected to the question I had perhaps This earlier. maybe is our last question, I think. Is it? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and it has to do with, um, again, overcoming fear. Um, I know you said that you didn't, necessarily overcome it, perhaps, or you, you still had it. But um, this question is that the fears are a great waste of time, and how do you flip fear into your favor? Mm. I don't know that fear is a waste of time. I think that um, sometimes fear guides us in the way that envy guides us. I often say to people, follow your envy. It tells you what you want um, instead of trying, trying to tamp down the envy. Um, fear tells us something. It gives us information. This doesn't feel right. Um, it gives us information about what you know, what we want to go differently. I think we, I think people imagine that you know, there's certain feelings that we we place value on our feelings, like um, you know, there's certain good feelings and certain bad feelings. But there aren't good feelings or bad feelings. Feelings are like a compass. You want to use them to guide you. And, um, you know, sometimes people come into therapy and they say, help me not to feel. Like, I'm in so much pain. Help me not to feel. But you can't tamp down one feeling without tamping down the other. So if you tamp down the pain, you also tamp down the joy. You're going to mute one. You're going to mute the other. Um, I think fear is very instructive. You know, what it, it tells you something about stay away from that or that's dangerous. Or, or maybe it's something that you need to work on not being so afraid of. So I would use that fear and try to understand it more. Okay. And I do want to ask one last question, even though you said that should have been the last question. And that is, what do you think we can all do? you got a large number of therapists. A lot of other people are committed to understanding mental health and well-being and mental illness. What can we do to advance the mission and increase accessibility of, of therapy for others? I think part of it is talking more about being more open about um, our emotional health. I've been doing a lot of interviews for this book, and, and interestingly, when I was on Fresh Air, Terry Gross said to me right before we went on the air, she said, I'm in therapy. I don't know if I'm going to talk about it on the air, but I just want you to know that for context in our conversation. And lo and behold, on the air, she said, I go to therapy. And, and, and a lot of people were really moved by that, to hear, to hear that. By the way, I want to sit in on those therapy sessions. I want to know, <laughs> what is Terry Gross talking about in her therapy sessions? Um, I had this really difficult interview today. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, I did an event with, with Katie Couric, and she talked a lot about her therapy. I did an event with Scott Simon from NPR. He talked about grieving his mother's death and, 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 and how painful that was for him. And, and this was, you know, these are very public events, and people are talking about going to therapy and struggling. And I think the more that we can normalize that, um, the better that will be. So I think instead of, instead of um, you know, keeping that under wraps, I think the more we can just be open, the more that, that people will feel less isolated and people will get help. Fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank thank you. Thank you Bob and Lori, for sharing your wisdom. Your, Lori, for writing this book and illuminating the therapy experience for all of us. Um, 
buy the book outside. Um, we hope to see you all at future Open Mind events, and thank you all for coming.